Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's event. My name is Josie Lee, and I am a student at Duke, majoring in a self-designed health policy major with an emphasis on global disabilities. On behalf of On behalf of the Global Health Institute, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar, which we are calling From Surviving to Thriving. We have an outstanding lineup of speakers and panels that will explore research needs and issues related to global disabilities, and I'm excited to get things started. Before we begin, a few important notes about the program. First, we will have ASL interpretation during today's event and we will also be doing live captioning during all the presentations. We will do our best to ensure that the ASL interpreters are visible throughout the presentations, but it is possible that some users may not be able to see them on screen when someone is showing a slide. We will try to keep those times to a minimum. And as I said, there is captioning available if you are not able to see the ASL interpreter. Second, we have time saved for an extended Q&A at the end of the program. And so in general, the speakers and panels will wait to respond to your questions until that period. But you can put your questions in the Q&A tab at any time during the event, and we will cover as many questions as we can in the final segment. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted publicly after the event. So just keep that in mind if you are sharing comments or asking questions. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Anthony Dutine, who is going to set the stage for our discussion today. Anthony is a physiotherapist and regional advisor on disability and rehabilitation for the World Health Organization. In this role, he supports the countries and territories of the Americas to strengthen their rehabilitation and assistive technology services and build inclusive health services for people with disabilities. In the interest of time, I'm not going to list off Anthony's many accomplishments, but we do have full bios of all of our speakers on the DGHI calendar listing if you'd like to read more. Welcome, Anthony. Thanks, Josie, and uh, a warm greeting to all of you wherever you are. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to the Duke team for your invitation to give some opening remarks to today's really exciting uh, and more uh, overly uh, really important topic and theme. And I hope it's a really rich conversation. Today, you're gonna be hearing about uh, creating global equity in supports and services for childhood developmental disability. And I'm really excited about the, the fact that this topic is being discussed it's a crucial this topic, it's an under-discussed topic, and it's a topic that needs much more attention. So I hope that this is the start of, um, uh, of some further discussions about how we can better address the needs for children with disability and uh, caregivers of children with disability and families uh, for children with disability. As Josie said, my name is Anthony Dutine. I work as the advisor for the Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization. Um, and in that role, I look into two areas of work. Firstly, creating equitable health services for people with disabilities. And secondly, looking at strengthening rehabilitation services for all people who require rehabilitation services. Frequently, rehabilitation has been a service that has been associated as being a program only for people with disabilities. And actually the World Health Organization now is saying that rehabilitation is really a service for all people at any time that they need it, from childhood right through to older age um, uh, and uh, important at many, many stages of, of life. The issue of child disability is a multi-sexual issue. I know that this conversation is framed within work around global health and certainly the work of the WHO more focuses on how we strengthen the health system to support and provide better services. But it's really important saying from the off that health is only one component of what needs to be a multi-sectoral approach to ensure the needs of children with disabilities and today particularly focusing on autism, uh, uh, hearing and cerebral palsy um, really, really takes an all of sector approach. It cross cuts from health to education, uh, to inclusive uh, local design, to family support, to social services, 
to justice and, and all other areas as well. So really, really important as we sort of talk and get into the discussions that we think firstly, how do we connect those areas together? And that's something that we're working closely on with WHO and work with other UN agencies on to make sure that there is a seamless transition between different sectors. I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the work that the health sector is doing and particularly looking at two areas um, uh, of uh, work. First of all, areas around health equity. Uh, we know that children with disabilities, we know that people with disabilities have the same healthcare needs as all other people. And yet we know that children with disabilities and people with disabilities face extreme barriers in accessing those same health services. I want to give a couple of examples. I worked in the response to Zika in Brazil and we saw frequently that um, mothers of children with Zika and congenital Zika syndrome and children with gen congenital Zika syndrome face many, many difficulties in accessing the same services, accessing vaccine programming from the primary healthcare services. It was often perceived that the services for those children were highly specialized services and could only be delivered at tertiary level healthcare services at city center levels. And so frequently children were turned away from primary care and told to go many hundreds of kilometers to uh, a tertiary care center for very basic and straightforward health interventions. Of course, some of those interventions that were required were more specialized and it was appropriate to be seen at those centers. But we need to make sure that children with disabilities are receiving their healthcare programming at the point that is uh, most appropriate for them and that they're not experiencing barriers to mainstream health services. And that creates broader inequalities. If a child with a disability can't access local he healthcare services, they're more likely to then experience difficulties in health, they're more likely to experience inequalities in their health. And we know that there is a dramatic inequality in terms of health outcomes for children with disabilities. The under five mortality rate for children with cerebral palsy and other developmental disabilities is far, far greater than the mortality rate for children without disabilities. And yet all too frequently that mortality, that higher death rate gets misattributed to impairments and disability rather than the truth, which is many of the underlying factors of the causes of, of death or ill health are eminently preventable. Diarrheal diseases, malaria, um, uh, malnutrition related issues, all of which with the appropriate care and support um, and, and, uh, and approaches and access to the appropriate services could be easily prevented. So it's a crucial issue that being able to access all of the same services as everyone else is contributing to the reduction uh, of child mortality and the improvement of overall child health. And of course, improving child health and well-being then leads into better functional outcomes, better opportunities for education, better opportunities for um, social integration as well, as long as those services in place. Finally, I want to touch on more specific services like rehabilitation. Um, and rehabilitation and habilitation for children with um, certain developmental disabilities can be a crucially, crucially important area of work as well. And many children with disabilities at the moment do not have access to the rehabilitation and habilitation services that they require in many parts of the world. WHO in 2017 launched an initiative called Rehabilitation 2030 that really seeks to strengthen that sector, strengthen habilitation and rehabilitation services for all who need them, including children with developmental uh, disabilities, with um, cerebral palsy, with autism and with hearing related needs in order to ensure that those services are of full quality and can be accessed. But of course, rehabilitation forms part of a whole spectrum and equal to rehabilitation comes the identification and early identification of children who may benefit from those services. I worked in Nepal some years ago and we identified that children with cerebral palsy who were in the rehabilitation services generally had their first appointment only when they were six years and older. They were being identified when they were at school age and not as young infants. And at that point had missed many of the windows of opportunity 
to ensure um, uh, functioning and ensure sort of um, ability to progress in terms of communication, in terms of mobility, in terms of other activities of daily living. So it really is important to ensure that rehabilitation and habilitation connects with the other elements of the system to ensure that these that children are being identified and being referred and being able to access the system early. So I hope these are some of the threads that will come up in your many conversations today. And as I said, I hope this is the start of what will be um, much more discussions on the topic. I'm looking forward to hearing, I'm looking forward to learning and uh, warm welcome to you all from uh, Washington DC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our two keynote speakers, Dr. Hans Forsberg and Dr. Diane Damiano. Dr. Forsberg is a professor of neuroscience at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, where he has served as Dean and Vice President. Along with Dr. Damiano, he is one of the founders of the International Alliance of Academies of Childhood Disability and served at its, as its first president. Dr. Damiano is a physical therapist specializing in physical medicine and rehabilitation approaches in children with cerebral palsy. She is chief of the functional and applied biomechanics section at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center. Thank you both so much for joining us and I will turn it over to you now. Yes, thank you for inviting me. I'm just sharing my slides here. So thank you for inviting us. And I'm very happy to see that Duke University sets this up because this is what needs to be presented and discussed in many, many other universities as well. And thank you, Lauren, for inviting me here and also for contributing to this project, uh, which Diane and I am doing together with the UNICEF and actually uh, now also the WHO uh, has, has joined here. Uh, I think, thank you, Antonio, also for the introduction, because I think you set the ground here for uh, why, why we need to do this. So we know that there is a challenge for children with developmental delay and disabilities, uh, in particularly in low and middle income countries. Uh, we have stigma, we have neglect, we have discrimination, and all leads to exclusion. Uh, what we need to do is we need to have a social and behavioral change in these places. And we also need to increase and promote inclusion and participation for these children and for their families. Uh, Anthony also showed you the lack of services which meeting their specific needs. And in particularly, there is a lack uh, at, at the community level. So what we need to do is to provide services that are supporting intervention and education for these children. Uh, what we also have observed in our tours is that the, when there is services, they are often of poor qual quality. They are outdated. So, for example, for cerebral palsy, they are using methods which we used maybe 50, 60 years uh, back. So what we need to do is to introduce evidence-based methods. We also know that the early childhood is a window of opportunity. And if we miss this window, it cannot be, uh, we cannot save it longer on. And what we have basing this is on new neuroscience, which has showed the neural plasticity, as well as there are emerging evidence uh, for early interventions. So, the objective of this UNICEF project, uh, which is then called Early Intervention for Children, with Dis uh, for Children with Developmental Disability, that is to develop a system model for early identification and intervention of children with developmental delay and disabilities, and in particular in low and middle income countries. And the long-term goal, and that's the reason why it's important to have both the UNICEF and the WHO 
behind us is that we want to provide global recommendations so governments can develop strategic national plans for universal healthcare. But just a few, few, few slides here. Who are then children with developmental delay and disability? Then you thought you could go to uh, the burden of disability and the Lancet Global Health, who then two years ago, they presented this uh, article in, in the uh, Lancet Global Health. But when we look more carefully, what we see is that in the blue staple, we have the vision. And in the next one, we have the, the hearing impairments. And then we have intellectual disability. While the very low uh, prevalence for uh, for example, uh, autism spectrum disorder or cerebral palsy was not even included in this. And I think this very much illustrates uh, that this topic has not been on the political agenda, on the global agenda. And I think this is really showing now how we need to change from surviving to uh, thriving. Uh, we, Diane, who will be coming just after me here, we actually made a commentary uh, to this and said that we really need to have much better data uh, on children with dis disabilities. What we can see is from high income countries, we know pretty well uh, that how, what the prevalence are. So for example, for cerebral palsy, we know it's two, about two in, in 1,000. And uh, for seeing and hearing in high income countries, you see it's much less than which made up the, the bulk of children in that global burden disease. We can also see that we have the behavioral, uh, which are uh, behavioral disorders, which, which are much more prevalent. So probably we have about 10% also in low and middle income country, or maybe even more, because in this series, which was published then 2016 in uh, the Lancet, uh, where they tried to make the scientific base for early child development and how much you could gain by investing by early training and, and stimulating children, they could find that based on how poor and how under, under malnourished children were, that you had areas in sub-Saharan Africa and also in South Asia, we had a very high risk to have a poor development where children who actually do not then have any pre-medical condition, as I just showed you, they will do to the poor nutritional and, uh, and then they are poor, they will not reach their developmental potential as they express it. So that means that about 250 million children or 43% younger than five years, they uh, have this risk and that we, there is then an urgent need to increase uh, uh, activities in these areas. So this is now the, the background. And that, now I come back to the project we are running first together with uh, UNICEF and it was supported by the H&M and now also which has been joined by the WHO. So first the governing principles, first of all, the rights of children with disabilities, then based on the UN's uh, convention of for, for the rights of children and the rights of persons with disability. And then secondly, and this is actually very, very important and which is often lost. And that is that we use the WHO ICF model where we are not only focusing on health, and not only on the social model, but that we have them all in interacting and where we have the participation, inclusion and visibility as clear targets, where we have the family-centered, not the tertiary, family-centered and community-based and multi-professional in intersectorial. We need to build this 
a program on evidence. And we also wanted now, since we had this window of opportunity the first year, we wanted to do start early. And with early, we mean before three, three years of age. So when we do this project, and now you should imagine we are coming with recommendations to the Ministry of Health, Education, Social Welfare in different countries. What we try to give them is the following models. One is what we call the twin track approach. That means that children with disability, they should be included in all mainstream activities. And this is a first very important step because quite often they are not included, they are excluded. But in addition, depending on their needs, uh, children have specific uh, needs or they need uh, specific services for, for their disability. So this we can call the twin track approach and, and I will come back to that in our model. The other one is a model which has been developed by UNICEF where you, at the base, you have all caregivers and all children. You see, that's a big base of the pyramid. Uh, on the next level, you have families and children who are at risk to get developmental delay or disabilities. And at the top, you have those who have very specific needs and definitely need to have uh, health care uh, services. Uh, so that means you have the universal support, you have targeted support to a bigger group, and then you have the, the very, very special. So the way we have done this is that we try now to develop a program based on systematic reviews. And we have had several working groups working on what tools shall you use when you identify these children as early as possible. And then you should imagine the situation is very different in low income countries and high income countries. We have looked upon the evidence for early intervention for parent education, active parenting, motor impairments, behavioral difficulties, visual impairments and hearing impairments. And this has been done by Diane and I don't know how much you will talk about this later mm -hmm. and also by Lauren who has been leading or um, uh, is leading uh, this. Laura Frant I'm talking about. And then we also had the communication and advocacy where we want to have the social and behavioral change. So now we have done this model and we are just about to implement it in three countries in Uganda, Peru and Bulgaria. And then the next step we will evaluate this program and then uh, see if we can scale it up. So this is where we are now. We have, as you see, we have two, two of these reviews are, are already published, three are under review and two others are uh, in manuscript form here. So this is the model. And, uh, excuse me. Uh, and what you can find here is actually both the twin track and the three level model. First, we have the vision. We have vision for screening for vision and hearing impairments, and we have for general development. When a child fails screening, first they will be included in mainstream ECD programs. And secondly, they will now be, and this is what we are really testing. We have a community-based, that means not far away, close to the family, family-centered intervention for all children with developmental delay. And that doesn't matter if it's they have motor delay or they have vision hearing, all will have now the same uh, intervention. And then those who have then special needs, they will now be referred to the healthcare system. This is a base and now I have just a few minutes to go. So let me just show screening how we have done. We have then searched the literature we found 140 unique tools and by doing inclusion exclusion criteria, we have eventually come up with seven stages. So we are going then, we have been going to these three countries and they have eventually selected ages and stages in Bulgaria, Malawi development assessment tool in Uganda. And actually in, in Peru, they are adapting a Mexican one. We have now for the 
the vision impairments, we have the screening protocol. For hearing impairments, we have this uh, protocol. And for the inclusion in the mainstream, we are now then identifying, have a protocol, how you identify ECD programs, how you adapt them, and that you secure the children are coming in. In the community-based family-centered intervention, it's four, four parts. One is monitoring and supporting the development of the child. Second is the caregiver education and training. And the third is child and family empowerment. And then the fourth part is assessment and monitoring so we can uh, then refer to the next level, which uh, we are still working on. This is very sketchy. And as we understand, I have a lot of more detailed information, but this is just to give you a hunch of where we are and how, how we are dealing with this. So thank you very much. And then I give over to Diane. Um, thank you, Hans, and thank you, Lauren, for um, letting us be part of this. See if I can get this to come up. Do you see my slides? I'm not hearing any response. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about best practices for promoting development of children with neurodevelopmental developmental disorders. Can someone please confirm they hear me because I'm not getting Yes, we can hear you, Diane. Oh, we can wonderful. Hear you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start the story back a little bit sooner than Han. So uh, in 2013, um, Hans and I and several others actually co-founded something called the International Alliance of Academies of Childhood Disability. And this really was formed by the three major academies of childhood disability in North America, um, Europe, and then in Australia. And over that period, um, what this group has been able to do is to develop a network of academies shown here um, across the world, and it's growing all the time. And the real mission of doing this was we really wanted to improve the health and well-being of children with developmental disabilities around the globe by trying to enhance local multi-professional academies um, and bring these together and, and basically work together to improve the lives of children across the world. And we thought one of the good ways to do this would be to partner with other major global organizations such as UNICEF and WHO. And we had seen that many documents um, and publications by these groups, but we, what we really didn't see were large scale global efforts dedicated specifically to children with disabilities. And we realized that, especially when we went to UNICEF, there were lots of new activities going from surviving to thriving for very young children um, that were at risk for many different reasons, but the children with disabilities were not really um, succeeding there and were not fully participating. And the other interesting thing we noticed is that in all these international efforts, none of the people in all of our academies were really a part of this or part of any of these documents. And we were um, a little bit confused by that. Um, thanks to Anthony at WHO and others that we actually, as a group, we, when we went to approach WHO, we found at the time they were working on this rehab 2030. And what they had not done yet was identify which pediatric conditions would be included in their 20, the group of 20 that they were going to, to include in this first effort. So we actually um, gave them access to our network. And when they surveyed, you know, who, how, what was going to be included in this. And, um, and then it ended up being decided that it would be CP, autism spectrum disorders, and intellectual disabilities as the first pass. And we've now produced with, um, with others, with WHO and others, we've produced two documents where we've reviewed what existing guidelines there were. Um, the first one was done by uh, the, us that are the CP experts. And the second one, we actually engaged Audrey Thurm, who's the head of autism research at NIH. And she uh, gathered the group to do that one. Then we, for our UNICEF project, as Hans said, that we realized that the big push at, at UNICEF was really in this early childhood, the first thousand days. And realizing that experiences in the very first years of life have a unique, powerful effect on their brain development and their basically their whole trajectory throughout their lives. And so in 2016, um, we got together and presented a concept note to UNICEF to try to 
to include children with disabilities in these efforts. And what we realized there is that at that time in UNICEF, health was not really part of the disability efforts. And again, Anthony said beautifully where it has to be multi-sectorial. But there were, which we were aware of, large international efforts to diagnose CP and to intervene sooner and, um, and as these efforts are underway. And we know that children with brain abnormalities and sensory loss such as vision and hearing are at high risk for suboptimal development, but they do not, you can't give them the same strategies that we would give typically developing children. Just giving them good nutrition, just trying to give them more stimulation, it's not enough. An interesting debate that came up while we were producing some of these documents and in these efforts was this idea about rehabilitation versus promoting development. And what we really are trying to do is promote development. But the issue of rehab doesn't really work with any kids because kids are gaining skills. We're not trying to get back to some previous more functional level. And we know that nutrition and enriched environments and reducing neonatal stress, uh, mother's touch and different handling practices have positive effects on development for all children. But again, for those with disabilities, these more typical pathways for learning are disrupted. If you imagine if you can't see or you can't hear, that closes a lot of the pathways that other babies use to learn. So what we really want to do here is that, um, and I think this is why the health sector for many years was rightly criticized, we don't want to go in and fix children with disabilities or make them normal. That is, not, that is absolutely not what we want to do. But what we really want to do is work together with families to assist children in their development. And the lessons from the ICF that's really educated the health system in particular was that we, the ultimate goal for children with disabilities is to have full participation in everyday life, to be in school, to be playing with their friends, to be included in their families. But what we also know from, from medical science is that there are unique opportunities in early development to lessen the degree of disability so that children can develop more optimally. And some of the data here on brain injury and plasticity for cerebral palsy, we know that for all babies, there's an overabundance of neurons and some will be um, live and some will die with about 50% of the neurons being lost. And there are also on the neurons or synapses that are competing and the ones that are used tend to survive and the ones that aren't go away. And we know that motor activity has a profound effect on these processes and shaping these synapses. And we know if your child is born with a movement disorder or any type of sensory deficit, that they will not, they're, if they're not moving, they're not developing those motor pathways in the same way. So they actually lose capabilities in that period. And we know that plasticity is far greater in younger nerve, nervous systems, but like the Hubel and Weasel studies where they, the, the kitten studies where they covered one eye of the kitten and they did not develop um, binocular vision, this is of course what they won the Nobel Prize for, that we know that if you don't intervene early, that that capability can be lost. The basic science for children with brain injuries is also very compelling, and we have not shown this in beyond animal models, but there's a, a several studies, for example, this one by Kolb looking at uh, recovery of neonatal rats with brain lesions, and they actually recovered with just several weeks of tactile stimulation. And then there's been work done on kitten models in CP by Freeland Martin, where they found that the brain injury itself and the behavioral um, deficits can actually be recovered with very early training. It doesn't happen if you do it later at, or direct muscle and brain stimulation. And the period of time is very early. It's, they projected it's within three to six months of life for motor. Um, it's really important to understand the development of trajectories and it's different for different skills. And what we want to do is intervene when the skill is emerging. So as you see here in the first screen, this is when the sensory development is starting and it's right around birth. So for vision and hearing, you really need, if you really wanna change a trajectory, you really need to get in there very, very early. For motor, it starts around three months again. But if you think, what are babies doing at three months? They're not really, able to do very much. They're just learning to hold up their head. They haven't learned to reach yet. Um, they're doing some moving and kicking. So it's really hard to figure out how to do that. And for social and behavioral communication skills, of course, that happens later, but definitely within the first year of life. So looking at this uh, UNICEF early intervention project, I was um, more on the intervention side. So I do lead the intervention group for CP. And Lauren has been wonderful to work on um, the ASD. 
And we also now have WHO, which is fantastic, who are also co-leads for these groups. And the primary focus for us at the intervention level is the children that actually have a diagnosis. They actually have a diagnostic assessment that says that they are they either have CP or a, they have autism spectrum disorder, or they're at high risk for developing that. Um, and we know now, and I know it's different for autism, but for CP, it's now possible in many children by three to five months of age. And what we're trying to do is develop a set of activities that can basically be part of a parent caregiver um, coach model. And we can give them strategies for playing with their children to promote their development at different stages. And we also are trying to ascertain the family goals. And that's the skill of the family goal is they want them to use their hands more for feeding. And that's what we work on. And that's how we develop skills over time. And this program will have multiple levels of support to the family, including at the top level or one level, professionals who really understand CP and can help advise and progress these programs. We have done, as Hans said, we've done a literature review here. This is the one on CP. I won't go into all the details. This is published in Developmental Medicine. Um, but we did look at the latest evidence and we wanted to look at zero to three for CP. And we particularly look for those studies that started within the first year of life or even within the first six months of life. And since this is a new effort to try to diagnose sooner, the studies really are, have very few studies have been published using the early detection guidelines. So we also want to use this to serve as a benchmark for these future very early studies. This just shows a summary of the table for the motor outcomes across all the papers that we identified. And what you can see here in the dark basically shows in different, like in the Bailey scales and um, the, basically the Peabody, you can see some changes in some studies that reach probably up to a small to medium effect size. So there, there are some data, but it's, it actually is not very compelling yet. There also are some um, data showing that motor interventions improve cognitive outcomes. These are three that had moderate effect sizes that did, um, they were all because the children used in rich environments. There were two studies on early RCTs, um, and these were, it was one out of Australia called GAME, and one on constraint um, movement therapy, which is really intense upper limb training in infants three to nine months from Sweden. And they did show positive effects starting this early on motor development that exceeded um, the, uh, the other intervention group. But what we know now, there's multiple new RCT protocols that have been published using these very strict early intervention guidelines. So we should have a better answer very soon. And what came out of all this, what we really get are principles. We don't really get the activities or the strategies. And we know that providing infants with active, variable, intensive motor challenges in stimulating environments is a type of intervention. The dose, we, it shows that typically higher is better, but not always. And it seems that parent implementation in the home has been one of the more effective strategies. And the timing, we don't know yet, but it seems like earlier, event, earlier implementation appears promising. These are also guidelines that were just published, in very similar data, but these actually give you guidelines for what you can be doing. So what they do here is basically once you get a diagnosis of CP, you refer to early intervention, you start working with the parents and together with the parents, you devise, you devise goals for your child. And here over here are the evidence for things that work and basically intense motor training, um, task specific, where you actually take a skill and work towards it. This is the upper limb training um, and also cognitive interventions. What you shouldn't be doing is passive movement or just general developmental stimulation. It's not enough. So where are we now in CP? Just to wrap up, Dr. Natalie Maitre is a neonatologist now at Emory and Rachel Byrne, who's head of the CPF Foundation. They're implement, implementation science experts. They've already done early intervention, early detection programs in this country. Um, they're actually coming up with a specific activities based on these principles for children by the, what age they are, what their motor level is, and across multiple goal categories. And this final packet that they're developing, it includes several experts already in the development, but it will be extensively reviewed by external experts, and then it will be translated and adapted to local settings. And then the pilot implementation should be 20, 22, or 23. And, and ASD, uh, Lawrence, which is not gonna be talking about it here, she had done the literature review, 
Um, she is now working with UNICEF and they are starting with basic principles from the caregiver skill training developed by Autism Speaks and WHO. But it needs to be, again, more specific, higher doses, more specific to the children's issues that they have um, and their strengths, and it has to be individualized. And here the focus is really trying to improve child outcomes. Um, I would say, which I was surprised to see, there may be less consensus in the, in the autism field and the best early intervention approaches. There's many that have shown to be effective. Um, many of them are proprietary. So we're trying to converge on a single accessible, which means basically open source evidence-based approach that everyone can agree on. So thank you for listening um, and I look forward to the rest of the day. Stop sharing. Thank you very much, Dr. Forsberg, Dr. Damiano. Hello, everyone. I'm Sumi Ariely. I'm an associate professor at the Duke Global Health Institute, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our three panels today. So we've heard the big picture overview of the challenges facing children um, around the world with disabilities, and also um, how global health systems and researchers are working to address those needs. What we're gonna do now is take a closer look at the context within three different developmental disability autism, hearing, and cerebral palsy. One reason we chose these three is that they're very different types of disability with their own unique issues and challenges, but also with important similarities um, in the obstacles facing people and their caregivers. Another reason is that we have outstanding Duke faculty working in these areas locally and globally, and who are interested in the multi-directional learning that can come from sharing information across different types of cultural communities and socioeconomic conditions. And they're gonna be helping guide the discussion in our panels today. As a reminder, you can put questions into the Q&A at any time during these panels. All of our speakers today will be available at the end to help address the topics that might be coming up. I'd like to first introduce our panel on autism, and we have three wonderful presenters here. First, Dr. Lauren Franz is an assistant professor of psychiatry and global health and a board certified child and adolescent psychiatrist. Her expertise is in implementation science and her research focuses on improving access to evidence-based autism services and supports both locally and globally. Dr. Sarah Branson is a postdoctoral researcher with Duke's Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Sarah is an autistic self-advocate and has been involved in a number of initiatives regarding autism inclusion in healthcare. She also works with the Duke Neurodiversity Connections and the Duke Disability Alliance to promote autism here on campus. Dr. Denai Fanin is an associate professor in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at North Carolina Central University here in Durham. She's a licensed speech language pathologist with research interests in cultural and socioeconomic effects on communicative functions and interventions. Lauren, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sumi. Um, so thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for those who've taken the time to join us today. I'm very excited to be here with two local, meaning Durham, North Carolina based um, colleagues, Sarah and Danai, to highlight some key considerations in autism services and supports. So in this panel, myself, Sarah and Danai will start off by highlighting from our individual perspectives, unique issues and challenges that we feel are relevant uh, when we talk about autism. Um, and then we will have a bit of a period of discussion where um, we'll sort of answer some questions um, around uh, the issues that we've raised. So a large part of the work that I do focuses on strategies to improve access to autism early intervention. And the idea with early intervention, uh, as Diane and Hans also alluded to, is that if you identify autistic children early in life, and you connect these children and their families with services that support child development, um, you can enhance both child and family quality of life. Globally, there is a tremendous disparity and tremendous gaps in community implementation of autism early intervention. But these gaps are particularly notable in low resource, culturally and linguistically diverse settings. So until now, much of autism research has been conducted with white, upper middle income families who live in North America and Europe. And this is problematic for many reasons, but one I'd point out is that it only provides a fragment of the story of autism. 
Autism exists across race, age, socioeconomic status, and nationality. So a significant barrier to community implementation of autism early intervention are various early intervention camps that exist. And over the past few years, there have been some positive developments in this area with the emergence of a class of early intervention called naturalistic developmental behavioral intervention, where interventions that actually share similar characteristics are now grouped together. So this can help move the field from an individual sort of intervention camp perspective to sort of a big tent approach where we can work together to identify common elements and common strategies that are actually shared across these individual, individual intervention approaches. And these common strategies can be very simple things, things like engaging children in child preferred activities, following a child's lead, using positive affects and animation to engage a child, and also using developmentally appropriate language during interactions with young children. So until recently, the perspectives and opinions of autistic individuals and other key stakeholders have really been included in the autism research agenda. But more and more, the field is recognizing the critical importance of embracing the principles of community-engaged research, this approach prioritizes meaningful bi-directional communication as well as longitudinal stakeholder engagement in all phases of the research cycle. Community engaged research can help uh, to ensure that the research discoveries actually translate into real life individual and community impacts. Structures such as community academic partnerships or community advisory boards can really help to serve as a bridging factor that can address potential ideological differences and ensure that research products have a high degree of acceptability for the communities that they're actually being developed to serve. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Sarah and I'm going to try and share my screen because she does have some... Um, she does have some, oops, slides. Um, can folks see that? Yes, I can see it. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I wanted to just briefly motivate further why I think it's important that autistic perspectives are included in any research on autism or in developing uh, interventions regarding autism. Um, and one is that since around the 1940s, when research first started being put out on autism, um, we've learned a lot from autistic adults about the condition. Um, for example, previously, uh, repetitive movement like rocking or hand flapping was observed in autistic children. And this was viewed as a non-functional behavior that was um, embarrassing or wrong and needed to be corrected. So at the time, intervention would focus on suppressing these repetitive movements. Um, however, we now know from hearing the autistic community that, um, sorry, is this better? I'm getting a comment that I'm a bit quiet. Um, that these behaviors are actually very functional. They can be helpful for self-soothing. Um, they can help block out unpleasant external stimuli um, and they can help reduce anxiety in autistic people. Um, another misconception that previously existed was that autistic people um, prefer to always be alone and do not have empathy and do not have the desire for connection with other people. However, a lot of this uh, is simply a difference in communicating empathy and a difference in how the desire for connection is expressed. As an example, um, many of us prefer to make less eye contact, um, but that is often because it's easier for us to focus on what people are saying and to give them our fullest attention and fullest um, understanding of what they're saying if we're not also trying to make eye contact at the same time. Um, so only from hearing these perspectives from autistic people can we develop a better understanding of certain behaviors and of how to work together to create a society that works better for everyone. And while there is a growing neurodiversity movement, um, which I think has been very helpful for increasing understanding of autism, there's still a very urgent need to ensure that autistic people with higher support needs are being included in the conversation. Um, about a third of autistic people 
uh, do not speak or have a limited vocabulary, a spoken vocabulary. And I think it's really important that those perspectives are not being completely left out. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So I thought of just a couple concrete ideas for how we can learn more and how we can ensure that autistic perspectives are being included. The first suggestion, suggestion is that any coursework that focuses on autism or any clinician training for clinicians who will be working with autistic populations like speech therapists, occupational therapists, um, ideally can include writings and perspectives from autistic people so that these clinicians can better understand the populations that they'll be working with. Likewise, um, when parents uh, hear that their child is diagnosed with autism, um, at least in our case, my child is also autistic, uh, the diagnosis came with quite a flood of information. We were given resources for suggested interventions, suggested books to read, uh, options for parent support groups, options for parent mentoring, um, and clinicians that we were suggested to talk to. Um, however, those resources often don't include any perspectives from um, autistic people. And I think that if we are able to include those resources at this first step, parents might be able to develop a better understanding of how their child might be experiencing the world. Um, and I guess even in an ideal case, they could be paired up with an autistic adult volunteer to just develop a better understanding of autism and hopefully have a more collaborative approach with their child. Um, and finally, autism researchers can seek out autistic adults as collaborators. Um, okay, the next slide. So to that aim, I wanted to just provide a sort of very simple starting point for resources um, that focus on uh, non-speaking autism. So one excellent organization uh, that actually focuses on any kind of nonverbal or non-speaking rights, um, but also has a strong focus on autism is Communication First. There's also um, some excellent authors here that, are, that I have listed. Um, I particularly like the book, The Mind Tree by Tito Mokopati. And there has also been recent research um, in this area that has helped to assert that um, assisted communication for those who use letter boards or other types of text-to-speech communication reveals agency and reveals purpose in communication. Um, so lending authenticity to these written accounts by non-speaking autistic people. Okay, so um, I agree with Sarah's uh, information that she's provided as a speech language pathologist. We really want to emphasize that we are helping with communication. Um, I'm going to talk about um, consideration of intersectionality in autistic children and families. So despite uh, the universal screenings, underrepresented children are still not identified or included in research as much as their uh, peers. Um, specifically, Black autistic children are still identified later as confirmed by Constantino and colleagues in 2020. Um, there are more objective screening methods being developed, and that might serve as a valid supplement um, to the traditional screener, um, but more qualitative work um, and validity work um, is needed to learn um, if these objective screeners um, would be helpful. Um, black children are also underrepresented in autism research, even when the setting like Durham, North Carolina, for example, should provide enough potential participants. So in the course of any studies involving culturally and linguistically diverse participants, we need specific aims or at least dovetail studies to address this. When considering the school systems, a black child is more likely to be identified um, as having intellectual disability or emotional disturbance. Autism is one of those classifications where we posit that misidentification as not being autistic is detrimental to a child's quest for a free appropriate public education, especially when the misidentified child has compounding contextual factors that make life more difficult for them. So, um, and beyond achievement and demographics, um, that identification rates in schools vary based on school funding, how that funding is managed, and also state accountability guidelines, which are all contextual factors. So rather than just looking at demographic factors like the child is from a low income background, um, they're black children, minorities, 
a more thorough examination of contextual factors and how this autistic child exists in society is crucial to learning more about these educational disparities. Um, so this, along with the child existing in multiple systems while carrying their own characteristics is when thinking about intersectionality is crucial. Of course, with children, we want to consider the intersectionality of the caregivers as well. Um, lastly, intersectionality is a crucial component um, that can make or break the acceptability, um, feasibility, or the appropriateness of the services um, we want to provide. Next slide. So there's a gap in the literature about whether racially and ethnically underrepresented children are over or under identified for special services. So for example, even though we know in the fields of education, school psychology, speech pathology, that some of our standardized assessments do penalize culturally and linguistically diverse students, um, resulting in many of them inaccurately being qualified for special education services. This is not the whole story. For educational classification of autism research suggests that the disproportionality for black children is an under identification problem. So we need, need to be more surgical in our research design so that we look at specific classifications um, and that culturally and linguistically diverse children do not end up under identified um, as being autistic. So like the recent um, refutation of the landmark Hart and Risley studies that proclaimed there's a 30 million word gap between low income and middle income children, this question of disproportionality in identification is also being refuted and re refined right now. Next slide. So here's an example of how rurality, race, and English proficiency is involved in classification disparity in the schools, which has prompted um, us to do further exploration as to why that is. Um, mixed methods can shed more light on the issue than just quantitative, unadjusted, aggregate, group-level identification rates um, that show that uh, Black children are more often referred for special ed. Um, we, um, we want to be more specific uh, about which classifications, which are the of the five customarily classifications, um, customarily uh, diagnosed classifications are analyzed. These um, North Carolina results in this slide show that um, rural black children, um, children with limited English proficiency and from lower income homes have a higher uh, probability of being identified as intellectual disability versus autism in North Carolina. And um, they, the children who are, and this is statewide, um, in areas where they have a higher number of relevant healthcare providers per 10,000 residents have a lower um, probability of being identified um, with uh, as intellect, having intellectual disability. So it's a resource issue as well, that contextual factor of how many providers are um, available in the areas. So, um, you know, the aim of this study was to consider rural um, rurality in North Carolina. It has similarities to Dr. Franz's work in rural South Africa. Um, and Anthony Dateen talked about um, how extended travel from the child's home for services um, that same issue happens in Halifax County, North Carolina. In fact, the superintendent told me that um, autistic children with um, higher, who need higher supports are bused an hour and a half away to Durham every day for school. And that's one way. Um, so it's similar to what is being seen worldwide. So we in North Carolina can learn from um, Dr. Friends's community engaged work in South Africa and um, the spirit of collaboration and transactional sharing back and forth um, can be beneficial. So I think that um, we probably have time for one question um, with this panel because uh, we're sort of being kept on, on track. Um, so I think um, I'm probably going to ask Sarah to, to answer this question. So Sarah, um, in the keynote, um, UNICEF is sort of proposing a tiered system where the first tier is around inclusion. 
So I'm wondering um, if you could sh share your thoughts about the potential benefits of inclusion, both for autistic children, but also for kids who are not autistic. Yes, of course. Um, I guess I think that the heart of it is that whenever um, a group of people is viewed as unfamiliar, there's often a sort of fear or stigma that can be attached to that. So if you have a typically developing child and if in their daycare and their preschool and their elementary school, they're surrounded only by other typically developing children and those with developmental disabilities are isolated in a separate classroom. Um, probably the typically developing children will become a bit more fearful or um, uncertain about autism. They might not know how to relate to autistic people. Um, and that feeds into the stigma that autistic children already face. Um, and on the flip side, it's also depriving the typically developing children of the opportunity to develop friendships and connections with autistic students. Um, I think that autistic students often have unique strengths to offer. Um, it's of course going to be an individual thing, but many autistic students are very uh, genuine, very honest, uh, very sincere and loyal friends. So I think it would be a pity to deprive typically developing students of that. And then the last thing I would quickly note is that um, often the accommodations that help autistic students will spill over and help other students as well. So for example, if a teacher tries to reduce their use of sarcasm or figures of speech, um, at least without clarifying the figures of speech, that often helps autistic students. But it might also help any student who is a non-native uh, speaker of whatever the classroom's primary language is. Um, and there's quite a few other examples of that as well. So thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Denaya, for being part of this panel. And I think to keep us on time, I'm going to probably hand back to hand back over to Sumi. Great. Thank you all. Thank you, Lauren. Next, we're going to discuss hearing loss. And again, we have three wonderful presenters. I'll start with Dr. Susan Emmett, um, who's an associate professor of surgery and global health at Duke. She's an otolaryngologist and public health researcher who studies novel pathways for prevention and applies digital innovations such as mobile screening and telemedicine to extend access to care to remote communities. Um, next, Dr. Yvette Sejas is an associate professor and director of Family Support Services at the Children's Hearing Program at the University of Miami. She's a pediatric psychologist and well-known researcher in the area of pediatric hearing loss and cochlear implantation. And uh, Ms. Michelle Benavie is the mom of two amazing children, Sam and Charlie. Her seven and a half year old son, Sam, was born profoundly deaf. Michelle and Sam worked together to help others with hearing loss, both through lobbying efforts and philanthropic initiatives. Welcome to you all. And Susan, I'll leave it to you to get us started. Thank you, Sumi. We are delighted to be here today. And as Sumi mentioned, I'm joined by Dr. Yvette Sejas from the University of Miami and Michelle, uh, Ms. Michelle Benaviv, who's a parent of a child with hearing loss. We will each be speaking briefly, and we've saved the second half of the panel for questions and discussion. So feel free to add your questions into the Q&A. There are an estimated 1.5 billion people affected by hearing loss worldwide. That's one in five people worldwide. And 80% of affected individuals are in low and middle income countries or underserved populations of high income countries, often with limited access to hearing care. Childhood hearing loss in particular has lifelong effects on speech and language development, school achievement, quality of life, and even future employment opportunities. Importantly, we already have effective tools to address childhood hearing loss. Our focus today is primarily on severe childhood hearing loss, and there are well-established treatment and rehabilitation options that can help children to develop language skills and to excel at school, spanning from cochlear implantation to deaf education with sign language. One of the biggest challenges we face is insufficient access to these life-changing interventions. This is a challenge both internationally and right here at home in the US. Even today, access for racial and ethnic mi minorities and children born to lower SES families do not have the same access as higher SES families. The contrasts are even starker in low and middle income countries 
where often only families with the ability to pay privately for services can receive the support their children need. Dr. Sejas is, is now going to speak about the options for children with hearing loss and the impact of hearing loss treatment on other disabilities. Then Ms. Michelle Benaviv will share her personal experiences as a parent of a child with severe hearing loss. Thank you, Susan, and, and thank you to uh, the Duke Global Health for inviting me to be part of this important webinar. Um, so as a, as a pediatric psychologist, I usually come into talking about neurodevelopmental disorders from a different standpoint. Um, and I've taken my career to really focus on hearing loss and that impact and how we can really improve access and equal access across minority children and, and anyone who is interested in the services. So as Dr. Emmett mentioned, uh, childhood hearing loss is one of the most common conditions in childhood, affecting one to three per every thousand births. And while most of these children have the opportunity to develop age appropriate speech and language skills or even attend mainstream school programs, this is really not possible without proper early identification and intervention. Um, families really need to be aware of all of their options early on. They need to be counseled on realistic expectations regarding whatever they consider to be that family or parent choice. This may include discussing cochlear implants or different technology, um, the importance of consistent device use, family support and involvement, or even attending weekly listening and spoken language therapy. This really becomes even more challenging for families of children with additional disabilities. And we really talked about some of these other things like autism in this webinar, but hearing loss, actually, there's a lot of overlap between hearing loss and some of these other neurodevelopmental disorders that have been discussed during this webinar. It's estimated that approximately 40% of children with sensory neural hearing loss also have an additional disability. This could be an intellectual delay, or as we've heard about today, autism. As in most other populations, early identification and intervention is really key to obtaining these optimal outcomes that these children can have. Children with hearing loss and um, these additional disabilities may benefit from this hearing technology, such as cochlear implants or hearing aids. However, they're often identified later and they're not linked to hearing services as early as children without these coexisting developmental disorders. For these children, access to a multidisciplinary team, which it could include, you know, psychologists, behavioral interventionists, um, is really, really critical in order to provide family-centered care that's going to help address all of the children's needs. For example, with the, with, um, while children with hearing loss may benefit from audiology management and speech and language services, Children with additional disabilities and hearing loss will likely benefit from those additional services such as specialized education programs, psychological services, or behavioral supports. As professionals working with this population, we really need to provide equal access to qualified providers for all children with hearing loss or even those who we suspect are at risk for hearing loss, regardless of where they live, what their race or ethnicity is, the family yes, yes, or even their medical or developmental history. I would like now, I would now like to introduce um, Michelle Benaviv, um, who is one of the families here at the University of Miami, who's gonna share her experience um, and her son's journey with hearing loss and how having access to the right group of professionals has impacted her son's life. Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Sejas, my friend. Thank you for having me. Um, on this wonderful panel. It's been so interesting to listen. Um, and I am just tremendously grateful for Dr. Sejas and the group, the team that has worked with my son. He was identified in Florida. There's a mandatory hearing test when you're born. Um, and my son failed. And my doctor reassured me that I had a C-section and everything was fine. And we have no prior family history, no reason to believe that there would be anything wrong. Um, and just encouraged me not even to follow up with the second hearing test. Um, but sort of my better judgment, my instinct, I wanted to follow up. Uh, and within days, we were connected to Dr. Sejas's clinic at the University of Miami. And uh, they confirmed our worst, uh, our worst fears, which is that our son was profoundly deaf. We never heard of cochlear implants. We had no idea what the options for him would be. And we were just, the only thing we knew is that we were committed to 
supporting him and caring him, caring for him and doing anything possible to give him the best outcome and an optimal uh, opportunity for all that life has to offer. So we decided very early on that we wanted to pursue cochlear implants, um, went through a series of um, appointments, tests, conversations, and determined that he was an eligible candidate and then went on to pursue that surgery when he was seven months old. Um, I've heard in all the different, uh, everyone that has spoken has talked about the importance of early intervention. Um, and I learned and I researched and I discovered very early in our journey, the more we could do early, the better his future outcome would be. And I think that it's really hard as a parent to reconcile that insurance, despite all of this evidence that so many of you have cited, um, did not want to pay for our son's surgery and told us to come back in a year when he was a little bit older. And if cochlear implant surgery would give him access to sound, that we could start all, you know, increase therapy and really start to teach him how to listen and how to speak uh, from such an early age at seven months, waiting until he was 17 months, uh, we knew would just be detrimental to his, um, to his advancement and his progress based on all that we have read, which many of you have reiterated. So that began a whole other process to try to go back and fight the insurance company, which we did uh, thanks to the help of Dr. Sejas and our team by presenting them with thousands of pages of research supporting our case. Um, and ultimately he was able to get the surgery as planned at seven months and is now, uh, thank God, doing incredibly, incredibly well. We were doing weekly therapy at the beginning um, which I followed up and really made a 24 seven job. Um, my husband, me, any caretaker, grandparents, everyone who was in the house um, was trained in this philosophy of um, audio verbal therapy, not doing any type of sign because we really wanted to promote a verbal speaking child. That was the route that we pursued. And there's different wonderful outcomes for every child with hearing loss and different things are right for each family. And we picked um, what was right for us. So what was right for us was a verbal speaking child. Um, and we received a lot of tools and techniques for how to get our child to speak. We would talk behind him to make sure he was really relying on his cochlear implants to hear everything. We didn't want him reading our lips. Um, and now thank God, seven and a half years later, he was going to join me today and told me how unfair it was because he's off of school today and wanted to play basketball with his friends. So he is now um, included and accepted and playing every sport and singing every song and dancing every dance and really just doing extraordinarily well. Thank goodness. Michelle, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, that's really powerful. Let's move now to questions. Um, and I'm going to start with um, a question for you, Michelle. Oh, sure. What was what was the most difficult aspect of this journey for you, and and how did you overcome that? Wow, good question. I think at the beginning, the shock of it, because we had no prior family history, we had no understanding of what options were before us. I remember actually in the hearing test praying that the doctors would tell us they found something that he could hear something and that he wouldn't be profoundly deaf. And when they said they could hear nothing, I assumed cochlear implants, which I had read a limited amount about it was, he was only a matter of you know days old would amplify what he could already hear. So I thought that meant if he could hear nothing, there was just no option for him to ever hear anything. So I was just at the beginning, it was just my limited information. So that was terrifying to me. Little did I realize the fact that he was actually profoundly deaf made him a candidate for cochlear implants. So that was actually working in our favor towards the outcome that we wanted. Um, and it was really just the shock of it and not knowing how I would be equipped to handle these unconventional challenges that my friends who had babies at the same time weren't dealing with. Um, I'm sure that we've all heard there's a story about getting on an airplane to go to a certain hot and sunny destination and all of a sudden you're about to land and the pilot tells you you're going to a fantastic ski resort and it's not that a ski resort isn't a wonderful vacation too and that you're not going to have a great time but you've packed bathing suits and you're ready to go to your 
sunny island vacation and this is a total change of plans that you're not prepared for. Doesn't mean you're not gonna have a great time, but you're not packed, you're not ready. This is not what you had in mind. So I think that's a good kind of analogy for how we felt. We knew that we were gonna love this child and support this child and make it okay. But um, the initial the initial shock of it for any parent is just a lot to digest and, and figure out how to move forward. Yeah, makes sense. Dr. Sayas, is hearing technology appropriate for all children with hearing loss? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And, and usually what we say is, you know, the most important thing is if you suspect there's a child that has a hearing loss or if they failed the newborn hearing screening, that they really go to a comprehensive pediatric, you know, audiology program. You want to go um, to a place where you're going to get all the options. And as Michelle said, for every family, it's it might be different, um, and you need to learn about all the different technology um, and what candidacy. What is that criteria? Because it's drastically changing almost every day. What we're talking about cochlear implants now, the the criteria has definitely changed. Um, we're uh, we're allowed to do it earlier. We're allowed to do it now with like single sided deafness. And so I always say, go ahead and refer these children. Make sure they go to a program that they could get the prop, you know, proper comp comprehensive, you know, audiological evaluation, as well as the consultation with an otolaryngologist. And at that point, you can learn about all the different technology that there currently is. And then with the family's, you know, input, then those decisions can be made. Um, it's really the family is key to making that decision of what would be the pro appropriate technology for that family. A follow-up question to that. What can we do to ensure that all children have equal access to early identification and intervention? Yeah, that is one that I, you know, um, also as a, as a minority myself, and, and obviously in Miami, we don't feel as a minority because there's a lot of, you know, Hispanic, low income families here, but it still is a challenge where we see that our children, the children, you know, black children, Hispanic children are getting through our doors later, despite, um, having failed the newborn hearing screening. And even as Michelle said, she personally was told it all will be okay. And she just didn't listen. Um, unfortunately, as we know, um, with minority families, there is this hierarchy, right? Where they respect um, providers, they respect the physicians and they will listen to that. And that automatically um, delays them coming through our doors. So what we have done and what I try and do is make myself available. I always say, if I can teach someone about hearing loss or just mention that, um, talk with, you know, the the children in my the parents of the children in my classroom you know we need to be out there um, and listening and and offer that support to families that are starting to ask those questions if you're a provider yourself if you're an educator a speech therapist you know going around your community um, we do sometimes free hearing screenings we do consultations with schools it's really connecting what we say is like these hearing healthcare providers with other income, com lower income communities and making sure we're available and accessible ourselves. Um, and that we've started to see at least a little bit more of that gate open, allowing some of these families to make those connections so that we could um, provide them with that support um, and that time that they need, as sometimes our minority families do need a little bit more time to make those decisions. Um, and so we want to get them here as soon as possible. So, you know, Hopefully this is a starting point um, where everyone here who's attending this webinar will go out, share this information, go out to communities, talk with other countries, right? This is a global effort. And if we all do our part, you know, one step forward, you share that with one person, that person shares it again, and that's where we can make the biggest impact. And I just, I just want to reiterate that because the more people understand the importance for a good outcome with hearing loss of early intervention, if my OBG, the OB that delivered my son would have said, you know what, that's really not normal, go get checked. Or my pediatrician would have said, that's really not normal, go get checked. Both of them told me, it's fine, don't worry about it. And what if I would have listened? And what if we would have waited months and months and months to realize maybe it's not fine and there is a problem. So the more people that understand how critical early intervention is, maybe more people will encourage those follow-up appointments just to be sure that everything's okay and get people in at the earliest possible moment if it's not okay to start addressing it. 
Absolutely. I couldn't agree more that increased awareness, um, not just within our, the, the hearing community, but, but very broadly is absolutely critical to this. Michelle, I'd love to end with you um, because your story is so powerful. What advice can you give specifically to providers working with families of, of newly diagnosed children with hearing loss? And if you have advice to families themselves, what, what are your parting words on, uh, from your experience? I think that I happen to have been connected to someone very shortly after my son was diagnosed to a couple of people that had excellent outcomes. And for me, that's what did it. Because I heard the doctor say that my son would live a normal life and would be able to talk on the phone and have conversations with friends. But I didn't know what that actually meant. And I think that until I was connected with some kids that had cochlear implants that were playing sports and singing songs and doing all these things that kids do, um, quite typically, actually, um, did I realize that this was possible. And that was probably the moment that I could actually take a breath. And I think that connecting patients to other patients with good outcomes, um, I love to talk to people and try to allay their fears. I love to send them little snippet videos of my son singing because I know that's a lifeline. And I feel that if the doctors can connect patients to one another to share their stories, even little things like, oh, my son's decided, you know, he's gonna go skiing and we need to wear a ski helmet that fits over his implants. Can I, you know, just for advice and just for um, the understanding of speaking to someone else who's in the same boat and who gets where I'm coming from, I think that has helped me throughout the process, but particularly right after diagnosis. Um, and so I think patient stories and connecting them is a great way that doctors can allay their patient's fears and make it easier. Great, thank you so much. I think it's time for the next panel. So we will wrap up and, and hand it back to Sumi. Thank you. Great. Thank you all very much for such an insightful conversation. Our final panel today is focused on cerebral palsy. And here are our three outstanding presenters. Dr. Michael Landry is a professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery in the Duke Global Health Institute. Dr. Landry is a health policy and health services researcher. His area of study is the interface between available supply, for example, financial and human resources, and increasing demand for rehabilitation and health services across the continuum of care. Ms. Deja Barber is a cerebral palsy self-advocate from Raleigh, North Carolina. She was diagnosed with spastic cerebral palsy at the age of two and has gone on to do a great many things, including participating in a variety of sports and being named North Carolina's Miss Wheelchair in 2017. She's currently working towards a master's degree in school and rehabilitation counseling at North Carolina A&T University. And Dr. Stacy Dusing is the Sykes Family Chair of Pediatric Physical Therapy, Health and Development, and Associate Professor and Director of Pediatric Research in the Division of Biokinesiology and Physical Therapy at the University of Southern California, where she also directs the Motor Development Laboratory. Welcome to you all, and Mike, I hand it to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Sumi. Uh, and, and permit me to say, uh, before we even start, um, the, the first series of panels and guests today have been just absolutely amazing. And uh, uh, in particular, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Branson and Michelle for uh, describing their experiences uh, along this trajectory. It's um, I think if I might even say, Lauren, when we, and, and Sumi and others, when we got together, um, th this was exactly what we had hoped would happen, was really this intersection between, you know, the communities and the researchers to try to think about and, and ideate of where this might all go. So, so thank you. Um, I will say, uh, so with our panel today, I think we've got some real rock stars coming up here, and I'm, I'm just so excited to, to hear from them. Uh, I'll only say a few things. And the first one is... Um, uh, Ant uh, from PAHO talked a little bit earlier around, um, mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, Rehab 2030, large policies that, that permeate uh, somewhere in space. Um, but the actualization of those contexts you know, really becomes down to the communities and the, the small areas of which we live. But let me, let me just maybe mention, so in the Sustainable Development Goals, number four really is around uh, inclusion and equitable education. We've already mentioned this. Um, 
as a stimulus for, for human development and access is, you know, when can we actually uh, engage in, in education? Um, and I think there was some, some points earlier made that um, without early identification and uh, understanding of, a, of, let's say, a physical or hearing or, or other impairments, it has a significant effect on that individual's ability to move into education, or at least it provide, it creates a barrier. Now let's, let's also remember, it's not just that individual, it's a family member in a community. And as we move into, let's say lower resource settings, which so happens to be where a lot of my experience has been, um, if, if we don't intervene and if there's not early intervention, that, that causes a whole cascade. And, and you know we all know this, but, but when you see it, and then you understand that much of this could have been ameliorated with early intervention. I think that's what really stimulates this. And I'll just maybe uh, share one experience. Um, I was uh, part of many teams, uh, but I responded to the tsunami in, uh, in South Asia in, um, in 2004, if I can get the dates right. Um, and so what happened in that event was obviously a huge tsunami, caused a lot of um, you know, death, one, destruction. But many people uh, who suffered anoxic brain injuries, so many of them um, who weren't at a very high severe level of, of brain injury weren't really identified. And they were only identified when they attempted to enter the school system. And oftentimes it becomes really difficult. So, so I'll stop there just to underscore this notion of how important that early engagement is going to be in terms of changing the curve of the future. And um, personally, um, you know, I think it's, it's really important to look at what we can do as maybe health providers uh, or what we can do as family members. But let me just take an attempt here and change that equation. It really needs to be what society needs to do to ensure that an environment is hospitable for everyone, despite or irregardless of, of abilities. So with that, I'm going to end my part and invite um, just an amazing person, Deja Barber, who's going to come in. Uh, and share some of her experiences around uh, cerebral palsy. Um, uh, so Deja, over to you. Hi, thank you, Dr. Landry, for that wonderful introduction. Um, first off, I will refer to it as CPU just because it's a sort of word and it does not take as long to say because I'll be saying it a lot. <laughs> and then who doesn't know cerebral palsy's acronym is CPU. So that is mostly what I'll be referring to just for time. So today, my side of this presentation will be to tell my experience of a person having cerebral palsy and what that looks like and what I could say possibly should be the path in that arena, not really what we see as the medical side. I'm getting more of the, if you have a client, if you have a kid in that position in that arena. So I'm first gonna start off with childhood. For anybody that's had kids, y'all know basically in the general, everything's about medical. Everything is what's wrong. Everything is, are they okay? Everything is well, which is fine. That's great. But as time goes along, what do you think that's going to do when it comes to them actually being a child? Focus should not always be on medical. My advice would be to more focus on the social side, focus on inclusive childhood. So yes, I agree. Early intervention is great. It's what should be done. It needs to happen. Early intervention is what has to do for the safety of your child. But when you get to the social aspect and the lifestyle of an inclusive childhood, that's also key. For example, I can say I was in the mainstream classroom from K to 12. I've been in inclusive sports. I've done adaptive sports. I bowled on a regular bowling team with regular children who were, not, who were atypical, who did basically everything almost like I did this time. I couldn't walk. So with CP, there's a huge range of CP. It's like a multitude of ranges of CP. So this, it may not look the same for everyone, but it's possible in any circumstance from nonverbal to verbal. I do agree, but my focus on that would be more of a social lifestyle, more of a letting them be involved, not really so much the disability at that point, but so much really just into what it means to be a regular kid. It's all about being a regular kid. Now, as you enter into teenage years, we all know that's not fun for any parent or professional that comes into social life challenges of what does it look like having friends, friendships in school, friendships in life? What does that look like getting along with mom and dad? And that arena, I also agree a challenge would be understanding your disability, because at that point, you're supposed to know. People are going to ask. They're going to assume they want to know what's wrong and you have to know an answer, because they're going to look at you like, why don't you know an answer? 
And that just, I can say friendships are going to be a challenge for any of you guys that have any disa- any disability related child or or for or client, you're gonna have a kid that's gonna be like, oh, I got friends. Oh, you're good. You're gonna have friends to a point. Because as we know, kids are very mean. I first say at the start, and they're gonna say what they want, they're gonna do what they want. So pushing the idea of friendships as in letting them truly understand what a true friend is. Are they really going to understand your predicaments of social? Do they know how to communicate with you? Do they know how to understand your kid? Is it a true real friendship for 10 years on the line? They could still call on that friend just to give them a basic text. Because I can personally say in my example, I thought I had some good friends. I thought I had some great friends up until about 15. And it comes to be the true factor of t adulthood and just kids being kids. So I would say in that arena, that's a major focus. And also understand the disability. Please let them know they have a disability. CP is very complicated. <laughs> CP is very hard to get, but as long as they know the basics of what they need, what it looks like, what their life may pertain to, what it's gonna look like, because so eventually their doctor couldn't be their doctor, or their parent could no longer be their parent. Could they explain what they needed and what they had to a total group, of, to a total stranger if they had to? That is very key in the years of teenage and like I said that's when I really started my advocacy work was about in high school when they really hit the work of figuring out what I have and what I can do with it because as they reach adulthood that becomes and what am I going to do with my life (laughs) what the world's going on what am I supposed to do now so in that sense it's more of like what does my future look like that's why it goes back to childhood and knowing what your future looks like knowing how you're going to adapt to it. So when they go into interviews, when they go in to get careers, they know what their standpoint's going to be. They know where they want to be headed. They know what their challenges are they're going to face and that they have a support system behind them. Like I say, it's all about having a supportive system, I would say, for especially with CP, because CP, like I said, has a huge range. True friendship, understanding what disability what their disability really is because that was a cp is very complicated and also to, and um to my provider people before i wrap up my fort like i said for my provider people letting them know what that means in the world of medicine because we have an issue of just telling the parents and then we expect when the kids turn 14 to 18 to 20 they know exactly what's going on they don't as in prime example I can give a funny story I just went to the eye after that today and I had no idea what my eye surgery was on and what eye it was so and the system for providers help out from the start say hey let the kid talk about it let them tell me what their medicines are let them tell me what their physical needs are and the just to my providers that'd be helpful and lastly to my parents take a deep breath it's gonna be okay See if you can throw some major curveballs at you that you really have no idea what's going on. But it also can be fun. It's also knowing your kids, because your kids are going to be on point they're fine when they're not good, as with any disability, but especially with CP. So just take a deep breath. Let the challenges roll. And if you need help, get help. It's plenty of help out there, just like my hearing loss people say. Help is there. It's just hard to find, depending on your level, but it will be there. So in that just... I think that is a gist of my thing. Just just take a deep breath. CP is CP, as I can say. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much, Deja. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, you, you've selected well by going into the field of uh, rehabilitation counseling. So we wish you all the best uh, as you complete that master's. Thank you for that. <laughs> Clinical. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And so, so thank you for sharing your experiences, uh, or at least a little bit of a taste. I, I might just underscore one part, which is include the person, or in this case, the child, right from the beginning in the conversation. Let them actualize and talk about and learn about uh, the, the impairments or the so-called diagnosis that they might have. So, so thank you so much, Deja. Um, and we'll come back later, I'm sure, with some questions. But now I'd like to pass it over to uh, Dr. Stacy Dusing, who's a colleague of mine uh, and uh, just an amazing researcher. Um, so, uh, Stacy, let's pass it over to you. And um, yeah, thank you for being here. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I was excited to get to be a part of this panel and webinar. Um, and as many of the presenters today have already shared, uh, diagnosis of disability is a challenge, but we're becoming more and more able to diagnose earlier. And particularly, this is true of cerebral palsy. Um, as Dr. Damiano had commented on, we are now identifying the ability to make a diagnosis of cerebral palsy between three and six months if children are in a path that we knew that they were at high risk. For example, children who were born extremely preterm or infants who have a neonatal brain injury um, around the time of birth. We should be monitoring those children and identifying their high risk status before six months of age. We need to respect parents when they bring their other children who are not born preterm into the pediatrician and say, I have a concern. We shouldn't be just waiting and seeing if that child's development continues to progress, um, but we should be looking into what the causes are for delays very early on. And the main reason this is really important for early diagnosis is because intervention matters, and intervention matters when it starts. Waiting until a child is two years of age to start intervention is not going to help them in the long term. We have to think a little bit about how this compares to the adult literature. If your grandmother had a stroke and someone said, we're going to wait two years to start intervention, that would be considered criminal. But with our young children who have a neonatal brain injury, we often wait one to two years to start intervention. Now, one of the major challenges, of course, is that we don't have great evidence, um, as Dr. Damiano commented on, for the interventions that we're providing in young children. There are a number of interventions that are still being provided routinely around the world that actually have evidence to show they're not effective. So as we work towards improving our evidence base, we need to combine these two things together for early detection as well as intervention. I feel very fortunate that I'm part of um, three different large clinical trial teams looking at interventions, starting as young as in the neonatal intensive care unit. And so if you've had a young infant, most of us know when you bring that newborn home, it's a shocking time for even a parent of a typically developing child. But that's especially true for families who know that their baby was born preterm or had a neonatal brain injury or that something isn't going right. The baby's having seizures, has a failed hearing loss. That's a very stressful time. One of the challenges we see in our system from a health policy standpoint is that it's about three to four steps to get your child into early intervention services. When we look then at that, what happens and the impact of that on families, families who have additional social burden and families who come from underrepresented groups are the least likely to navigate that system successfully. And the result is that we have far less children from underrepresented groups getting early intervention services and getting into the services they need when their brain and their body is the most receptive to change. Um, so this is a really challenging time. And so we're looking now at how we can provide intervention very early. I'm not gonna go into great detail on each of the studies, but I'm happy to, to share more information individually um, or to answer questions around those specifically. So let me stop here and see what other questions we have because I know we're a little short on time. Thank you, Stacey, um, for setting us up for that. And, and uh, you know, really congratulations on all the work you're doing uh, on the trials. Uh, it's gonna have an effect and impact. Um, we'll, we'll probably go for another few minutes on this panel, and then we'll pass it back to Sumi uh, for the remainder to, to triage and to stick handle some of the questions. But my question for um, Deja and Stacey here, uh, maybe we'll go in that order because you're, you're both bringing in a different perspective, but where does technology fit in the future? So, so by that, I mean... You know, we, we, we have moved forward into the 21st century where technology can mediate many of the impairments we might see or, or you know, that folks might experience. So, so where, do, where do things like artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, brain machine interface, where could that fit in, in, in the bigger picture? Let's start with you, Deja. Um, I would say when it relates to AI or anything technology-based, one for sure would be just wheelchairs and just anything that deals with mobility devices. Cause I do believe that that area can be really impactful just because if we can start monitoring more stuff by fingers, by eyes, by anything that doesn't really directly have to use really a lot of motor skills, I think is where technology can come into play as well. Um, I do think 
in the sense of learning, there would also be a big arena in AI and technology because as we know, as we had to do with COVID, um, <laughs> we had to learn Zoom, we had to learn everything technology-based online world. So I do feel like, especially with TP, that I feel like we have been kind of in this old school effect where we just really get learning boards and say point to the cat on the screen. And we're not really advancing our skills to say anything of like true learning. So I do think AI and technology could base real learning and real understanding to know that the children are learning what they need to know. Um, yeah, I think that's mainly my tip for that in the basis of technology. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Stacy. Yeah, I think um, we can look at this from really two different perspectives. One is that technology could help us with some of the early identification of disabilities. However, when we think about this as a world or a global issue, not everyone has access to technology. So one of the nice things about the cerebral palsy early detection guidelines is that it walks the path of if you're in the first world and you have access to technology like neuroimaging um, or some of the sensor-based learning that we can look at movement quality and movement patterns, what do you use? that for versus if you're in a country that doesn't have access to those things. Um, how can we still make diagnoses um, early? And I think that's a really important component. Um, so I think the technology may be less helpful, actually, with early detection um, in the grand scheme of things from an AI or the machine learning standpoint. However, I think it will be more helpful, as Deja commented on, with the idea of what do you do rehabilitation-wise. You know, I look at intervention from two different perspectives. One is the young child, where I'm trying to change their brain but they need a huge dose of intervention. And I'm actually trying to change all the pathways that that baby has to minimize or ameliorate the impact of the cerebral palsy on them or to make it less significant for them. There's a different perspective when you shift into saying, you know what, we've probably passed the point of maximum neuroplasticity and now it's about adaptation and access to the world and building your friendships and just giving you the opportunity to do whatever it is you wanna do, but I'm less likely to change your brain. Um, and so I think that AI and particularly adaption like um, the wheelchairs that Deja was talking about is really important once you hit school age, for children when we really need to get them fully engaged in the world around them um, and with their community. Well, thank you to the, the two of you for those um, answers and at the at the risk that many of you are going to uh, apply and will eventually be competitors. The, there is an R21 right now <laughs> uh, that is looking at M health technologies in low and middle income countries, which will address uh, people with disabilities in the communities. And so uh, so that that's one particular uh, grant that we're going to be uh, adapting some AI and some intervention where there are no providers. Um, uh, earlier on, we talked a little bit about the, the workforce and, and maybe how that could be moving forward. We, we also have to consider the likelihood of being able to generate the workforce volume uh, in many countries is, 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 or settings, I should say, uh, it could be challenging. And so I think we need to just change the equation. So let me just say thanks, Deja, and thanks, Stacy. As always, you're just amazing. And I'm going to pass it back to Sumi. Great. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for sharing your insights and giving us so much to think about. Um, the discussions are stimulating a lot of thought, and we're going to spend our remaining time addressing many of the questions from the audience as possible. Um, and I believe all of our panelists are still with us. So please continue to put questions in the Q&A and Josie and I will try to get to as many as possible. Um, so I think the first one I'd like to address to Dr. Fanine. Um, I'd love to get more of a focus on the disparities you talked about in our own communities here in Durham in the US. And also I'm interested in some of the ways that culture, community social practices, linguistic practices, religion may play as a protective role in the course of living with disabilities in persons with autism. So is there a research here your colleagues are doing in this area or what may be some interesting questions that we could ask? I think- You're muted, um, Dana. you're muted. Yeah. Sorry, there is um, research being conducted, um, for example, scoping reviews um, that, uh, uh, Dr. Franz and some of her colleagues have been working on um, trying to use uh, mixed methods. So asking people, um, interviews, focus groups, interviews uh, about their 
caregiver, uh, their experiences about their parent-child interactions, how they play. I, I think that's uh, one way to find out um, what some of the protective um, and positive characteristics are culturally. I think we can learn a lot from um, different cultures. Uh, my parents came from Zimbabwe 52 years ago. And I think they have some, you know, parenting skills that worked out well for my brother and I. But as a speech pathologist, we are, you know, we tell people, families, this is how you talk to your child. This is how you play, um, you know, without that cultural humility, without considering that they may be doing some things correctly as well. Um, with uh, in actual research, you know, methods. Um, an example, um, I replaced a neighborhood uh, survey um, with one that talked about neighborhood supports rather than the usual, are there food deserts, crime, graffiti? Um, you know, looking at more of the supports. Hopefully um, by using qualitative methods and mixed methods, we can find out uh, more about the supports, the facilitators, um, of facilitators of uh, raising their children. Um, and to address uh, Josie Lee's question, it's similar. I think specific um, steps that I would take would be to uh, ask different stakeholders, uh, people who make the decisions in identification, as well as the caregivers. Uh, we wanna know, uh, you know what prompts uh, a caregiver to uh, say they have a concern about a child, but we also wanna know uh, how we are evaluating children, um, what resources are being provided. Um, so that I, I would say finding out from direct stakeholders um, and uh, autistic people and families of autistic people would be a good step. Thank you so much. This next question is directed towards Dr. Susan Emmett. Um, we have a question regarding how insurance companies can be encouraged to provide early intervention services earlier. Thanks, Josie. And I appreciate this question, Dr. Clements. I think it this really, it's a complicated answer and it, it requires a two-pronged approach. Um, firstly, it's really necessary to work at the, from, at the policy level to advocate for, um, improved access to early intervention in particular, um, really across the board, not just for hearing loss, but in other, other areas as well. Um, but that has to go hand in hand with um, both providers and families really actively engaging with insurance companies on a case by case basis. Um, because at the end of the day, until we've, we've fully changed policies across multiple insurance companies, we're gonna to have to work child by child to make sure that everyone gets the care that they need. Great, thank you. Um, Michael, I would like to direct this to either you or Stacy. Could you share what may be some of the promising advances in overcoming the barriers and challenges to integrating early screening um, for cerebral palsy and maternal child health or yearly well child visits? Or are there any favorite programs that provide some lessons learned? Maybe Stacy, can you please take that one and then I'll come in after. Yeah, I would be happy to. Um, one of the things that I think is really helpful is the idea of looking at um, how we can get uh, pediatricians on board with developmental screening. And so when we look at the numbers across the country about how many pediatricians do routine developmental screening, um, the numbers are not where they need to be. Uh, they have increased over the last decade um, but physicians have very limited time in the room with a patient. And so implementing strategies like having the family complete before they arrive for the visit, the ages and stages questionnaires, um, or the social well-being of young children, looking at those questionnaires before the family gets in the waiting room. Because if you've ever taken a two-year-old to the pediatrician, you can't fill that form out in the waiting room. You have to do it either ahead of time or when someone else is watching your child. So we need to implement that as part of our universal health care, where we're starting to screen family or screen children at every pediatrician visit. We also then need to respect that parents know about their children, but 
if they say, I'm not sure if this is an issue, our pediatricians need to be comfortable with saying, let's go ahead and refer you to experts now to do that evaluation and not wait and see. I think some of our healthcare policy has really pushed back against the idea of referring kids too early into services. When I would say, you know what, if you can refer that family into services early, even if the child doesn't need services, you might be able to help give that parent more anticipatory guidance so that they know, you know what, this is normal and I don't need to worry about it. And Maybe right now it's normal, but these are red flags to look for. And so I think it's a combination of adjusting our healthcare policy, but also helping to make sure our frontline providers, like pediatricians, know what to look for and when to get kids into services with an expert versus refer relying strictly on the quick screening that they're doing um, in the pediatrician's office. Yeah, I agree, Stacey, uh, <clears throat> with all of that. The uh, the only point I might add is if if um, in, in scenarios like you're describing, the reliance is solely on the health system, I believe we will fail time and time and time again. Uh, earlier this afternoon, um, I, again, there's so many great points and pearls of wisdom that people have mentioned, but somebody mentioned this, this notion of multi-sectoral intervention. Uh, in, in all honesty, that is the only way I think we're going to change the curve here. Um, the incremental change, in other words, sort of improving maybe diagnostics or early intervention in, in, a, in a physician's office or a health system, I mean, th th that could have lasting effect. But as we look at the entire globe or certainly entire population, I, I think we need to change things around. And so um, there are some new interventions, well, sort of old that have become new, but but there are milestones, right? And we talked about them earlier, and I think our, some of our colleagues mentioned them early. At certain points, the window opens for intervention, and we can diagnose or we can understand movement patterns that, that could be predictive of outcome. But if you're in a low-income or a very resource-constrained environment, whether you're in Appalachia here in North Carolina or, or in the world, uh, you, you're not going to have access. So I think we need to really move away from it's only about healthcare intervention and talk about how we look at it from a population health perspective and, and really encourage and support uh, this intersectoral approach. Thank you for that fantastic response. I'm going to pose another question um, from Julie for, um, um, let's see, it says, Thank you for Dr. Um, Sejas. It says, thank you for this panel and for all that's been shared. Um, as a parent of a son with unilateral hearing loss and mild CP, in our journey, I had to jump through many hurdles for initial screening, insurance approval, and advocacy more throughout his life. He's doing well, and I mentor other parents starting their journey, but can you please discuss what is being done to help leverage the field for more families needing intervention? Well, thank you, um, Julie. That's a that's a that's a lot in one question, and um, thank you for also sharing off, obviously your story and the fact that you know hearing loss also does sometimes have other you know conditions that are part of it. Um, as you said, you know, and as even Michelle, that was part of our panel, it's super important to link families to one another. Um, as you know, as a professional, I often kind of try to provide that support. Uh, I try to link families, and and even. The so I may say something, it's when they hear and they see from another family um, that they really have that, that, that better connection and, and more hope for, you know, the future. What I could say is, you know, I'm part of, you know, different boards and organizations, and I'm usually the one in the room saying we need to do more to the families. We need to, you know, stop talking so much about sometimes technology and um, access to, and even like the medical care part, and really talk about the family and how we're going to support the overall family system. Um, so I know a lot is being, you know, done from that side in terms of different organizations trying to um, provide more support, more um, family groups, more um, organizations are really um, trying to kind of um, develop programs that would be more specific for the entire family and that that mentorship will continue throughout the lifespan. What we found is that the majority of those supports might be very early on um, and then they kind of disappear. Um, and so what people are saying is that these same supports um, 
even for when that child becomes an adult, um, still, they still need supports and peers. And so I do know organizations and different groups that are working on that. Um, I say it's baby steps, it's little steps at a time, but people like you, people like Michelle that are out there along with us as professionals, um, the more we kind of talk about it, the more we say that this really is an issue um, that we need to be more aware of and, and create more of these intervention programs and support both peer and family support programs, the more we're actually going to get to a place where everyone will have access to these programs. Great, thank you so much. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I'd like to direct this to Dr. Branson. Sarah, um, in Rehab 2030, one of the values is self-determination. And a lot of the panelists spoke about this, meaning that rehabilitation services should really promote an individual's capacity to control their own life. Wondering if you could share some additional thoughts on the value of this, especially in autism. Yeah, I think this is a great question. And um, I think some of the uh, most unfortunate barriers facing autistic people uh, or also people with intellectual disabilities is sort of a lack of um, self-determination offered to them. Uh, there have historically been um, treatments that were implemented sort of on people without taking much in, uh, input from them that sort of, uh, for example, in particular, using electroshock on autistic people to try and modify their behavior. So I think um, making sure that consent is a part of treatment whenever possible and that the person has the autonomy to set their own goals um, and have their own perspective being taken seriously is probably one of the most important steps in making sure that autistic people can feel safe and included in their treatment. Great, thank you so much. Um, well, it looks like that's the end of our time. So we'll leave it there for today, but it's clear that the conversation um, has spurred critical ideas for all of us. And it's really our hope that we can build on this discussion to continue designing and refining care systems that are more inclusive, equitable, flexible for the diverse needs of people and research in this area. I'd like to thank all of our speakers for taking the time to share your work and perspectives. And thank you to our DGGI colleagues for helping to plan this event and to our wonderful student intern, Josie Lee. And finally, a special thanks to our ASL interpreters and captioners for helping us ensure everyone could participate in the discussion today. The webinar has been recorded and will be posted to the DGHI YouTube channel in a couple of days. Please feel free to share this with others who couldn't make it. And thank you all for taking the time to participate.